Um, okay, well, we arrive. So, welcome back. Thanks for coming back. We didn't scare you away. Yep. Um, didn't scare you away yesterday, so that's good. Um, yeah, uh, agenda for today is to talk about text and sequence data in general. Um, then talk about autoencoders and what you can do if you don't have labels for your data sets. Um, autoencoders are sort of more stuff that you can do with unsupervised learning. Um, then we'll also talk about a little bit more on how to actually tune networks and uh, go through some more, more in-depth examples of sort of bigger, more realistic applications. Um, if we have time, uh, we'll talk about reinforcement learning some more, um, and then we'll wrap up with sort of summary and what's happening more on the research side and you know things people are excited about today. As usual, ask questions, please. So words. Um, yeah, we'll talk about translation, sentiment detection, other things you can do with text, um, but not all of them. Um, how do we actually make networks that more or less understand language in some way? Um, one of the challenges is the fact that there are so many words um, in language, um, so it's important to represent them in, in some reasonable way. And we'll talk about how to do that. Um, and then we'll talk about recurrent networks, which help us remember, help the network kind of remember what it's seen before um, as it's processing later data in some sequence. Um, yeah, OK, so we'll do that. Let's start just by talking about language, right, um, and why this is actually interesting. So obviously, on the potential side, if we can get computers that actually understand language in some deep way, that really opens up lots and lots and lots of potential applications. Um, and we see some of them already today, right? Siri, Alexa, et cetera, um, can understand certain simple queries. Um, and at the same time, we still see how much is left to go to be able to really you know, tell your computer, here's what I'm struggling with today. Please write a poem about this. We're pretty far away from that. Um, yeah, read text, write text, etc. cetera. Um, traditionally, and to some degree still today, but when people started trying to do AI um, back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, especially 60s and 70s, um, there was this notion that language, you could just, you know, if, if we're clever enough, we could just describe it, right? Here's what English is. Uh, here's all the rules and all the exceptions and all the exceptions to the exceptions. Um, and so we can, you know, sentence diagram our way through um, through all possible correct sentences. And if they're not correct, why would you possibly want to use them? Um, and then once we did that and we understand the meaning of all the words, um, we can just have this giant database that describes English. Um, and yeah, that'll be that. We can just use it um, for various applications. This is a classic example in linguistics of a perfectly valid grammatical sentence that means absolutely nothing. Um, so yeah, this turns out to not work very well because language is weird. Um, and really starting in the 80s, and I think actually starting at IBM, if I remember correctly, um, they started this more, much more statistical approach that said, you know what? We're never gonna be able to write down all the rules. Let's just try to infer some of the patterns and how people actually use language. Um, and yeah, we'll read a bunch of text, we'll count things, um, and then we'll use that as a model to try to understand what kind of things are actually valid sentences, for example. Um, it's less precise, but it's much more flexible. So here's one example, you know, just to give a flavor, right? If you're looking at this frequency curves of the use of Apple, for some reason, people started putting the word Apple at the start of sentences much more frequently around 1970 something. But that must have been it, right? For some reason, capitalized version just went became much more, much more famous. Um, as a computer, it probably doesn't know why, um, but it knows that, hey, something happened, um, and so now, in the middle of a sentence, if I see a capitalized apple, um, I'm not surprised after 1970 something, and I am surprised before. And so if you're analyzing text from you know, different times, you might actually analyze it differently based on what you know about word frequencies. 
obviously this is a really simple example, but we'll see um, you know, what you can do with, with networks, et cetera, that uses the same basic principle. Um, yeah, so what's hard about text? Maybe I'll, I will not make this a rhetorical question. Any, I don't know if, if, if you have any experience with text processing or just intuition for it. <clears throat> Maybe I should have said language. <clears throat> Right. Lots of things we say refer to other other concepts or ideas or things that we mentioned, you know, three chapters ago, um, and possibly refer to it in some oblique way. That darn guy refers to, you know, the person that was being obnoxious three paragraphs ago. Um, how do I know that? That's one good example. There are many others. Um, ambiguity, right? So here are some, some examples. Um, the tank is full of, what does tank mean? I don't know. Is the next word going to be soldiers or nitrogen? Um, right? Um, you know, the word ground, is it a noun, a verb? Does it mean dirt or the floor of this room or to ground, you know, some electrical circuit? Jaguar is a great example. I think I have it on the next slide. Um, here are some meanings of Jaguar. Cars, aircraft engines, shield supervillain, band, a pseudonym of some other person, Kenyan musician, three different films from different years, an Atari Jaguar, a supercomputer, a CPU design. Oh, yeah. But wait, there's more. A bunch of different sports teams, military weapons. But wait, there's more. <laughs> um, right? So when you read Jaguar in some text, um, you know, maybe if you had that database of what English means, you might have like two or three or four of these meanings, but it's hard to have all of them. Um, and even if you have them, how do you know which one is being referenced um, in, you know, the, the context you're in? And even worse, sometimes maybe it's, you know, three or four of them at the same time. Right? The, you know, Jaguar, the whatever sports team is named after the Jaguar warriors of the whatever, and they like to drive Jaguar cars. I go, oops, one sentence, three different meanings for the same word. Um, yeah, so the other thing is it's not anywhere close to unique, right? If you're trying to express ideas, um, there are many, many, many different ways to say, to say the same thing. Um, and so if you're trying to write a program to say, okay, you know, Sentiment analysis is a classic example where you start. It's sort of a relatively simple problem. It says, what are all the good ways I can say something positive about you know, IBM? Um, it's kind of hard to enumerate them. Um, and so somehow you have to figure out how to, yeah, how to figure out uh, the meaning of sentences you've never seen before. Um, yeah, context. Sort of the same thing in terms of you know, what, what are you referring to. Um, often there's assumed context. Right, so when you say, when you read, I press the suit, you know, even if I know you're a lawyer, did you press it before or after going to work? Right, it would mean different things. <clears throat> um, then there's even more complicated things like humor. Uh, I found a great uh, set of, you know, papers and blog posts and people trying to make computers that are funny, that tell jokes. It was, it's not very far along. Right, so both understanding why is something funny or is something funny, and even worse, trying to generate humor is, is really hard, because it's kind of hard to explain sometimes why, why things are funny. And then, you know, Twitter is its own crazy, crazy language that has some resemblance to English, or whatever language you're interested in, but only vaguely. Um, so uh, let's start with, you know, thinking about, like I said, sentiment detection. Um, and thinking about how we might actually try to tackle this problem. So there's this classic data set from uh, IMDb of movie reviews, um, 25,000 movie reviews labeled as positive or negative. And uh, the goal is to say, OK, given a bunch of labeled data, so it's still in the supervised running space for now, um, how do I you know, predict positive or negative, hopefully with high accuracy? Um, 
And yeah, so let's just jump into some code and look at it. So first I have a, a book, uh, a notebook that shows basically the data set, right? So kind of just loading it and let's, let's look at what this kind of data looks like. Um, and then we'll actually talk about how we might tackle it. If I can find my mouse. So we'll come back to approaches to tackling this kind of thing in a bit. Um, but here's the data set. So you can grab it from the Stanford site. Um, right, so setting up random stuff. Uh, one note for anyone trying to follow along with the code. Um, there's a bug in the Keras built-in IMDB little library. And so you have to actually go and um, download like an old version of the data set and you know, un unpick it manually. So that's what I do. Um, we get 25,000 train and test sequences. Um, and um, here's what the first review looks like. Doesn't really look like English, right? Um, so in fact, uh, the way these data sets are often encoded is by having a, a mapping from word to an index. Um, typically, at least in this case, and I think pretty usually, uh, with the indices going from most frequent words um, first. So number one is probably the. Um, and you know, I have no idea what number 5,948 is, but we can find out. Uh, so it comes with the, this index that you can get um, that tells you what the mappings are. You make the reverse index from index to, to word. Um, and then if you print out, you know, here's the top 20 words. Burr, I think, is a line break, but the others look like common words. Um, film is actually kind of funny, right? The movie would not appear very frequently, as least frequently at least in English in general, but in movie reviews it does. Um, yeah, and so one note, this means if we want to say, you know what? We're not going to look at really low frequency words because they're hard to make sense of. You can just cut off all indices that are above some some index. Um, OK, so now we can actually make, make reviews that we can read, right? And so you want, so well, this is our task, right? To read something like Rommel High as a cartoon comedy, and at the same time as some other programs about school life, such as teachers, my 35 years in the teaching profession lead. And then, you know, I, I cut off after however many, 30 words. Uh, but it keeps going. And the question is, to read this whole thing and be able to say, is this a positive or negative review? For this first one, right, from the first 30 words, I can't tell you. Um, it's not, not at all clear. Um, some of the others, like the third one, brilliant overacting by Leslie Ann Warren, et cetera suggests that maybe that's going to be positive. So you never know. It could, at, at the very last minute, you say, but despite all of that, it was terrible, um, et cetera. Here's another good one. Uh, where was it? This is easily the most underrated film in the Brooks canon. That suggests it's a good review. And then, sure, it's flawed. That suggests it's a bad review, and so on. Um, OK, and then the labels are. Zero and one, positive and negative, half and half of each. Um, for processing these kind of text things, it's useful to understand how long they are. So I made a histogram of review lengths. Um, you can see that the vast majority are under 500, and some go up to about 1,000 words in length. Um, and at least the way we're going to tackle this First, uh, we're going to end up using fixed length windows, so pad short reviews and cut off long ones. Um, so it looks like, you know, for this data set, two, three hundred would be reasonable length. So I, I compute the lengths of all the reviews, how many words. And so this is a histogram, and this is just a cumulative distribution. To see if I cut it off, say at 300, that's going to give me 80% of them untouched, and you know, shortened value, the length of the review in words. Yeah. So this is our problem, right? So, given what we learned yesterday, 
it's not really clear how we might go try to build a classifier for this, I think. Um, So let's come back to it. I, mean, I guess one thing we could do, right? And in fact, I think I, I may even have an example of trying to do this, is just, you know, pad short reviews to some fixed length and cut off long reviews. So say that we're going to pick 300 words, treat that as a 300 index vector with just the, those numbers that we have, and then try to train a neural network to say, look, given these, um, yeah, given these words, Predict a single, you know, a single output, yes or no, positive or negative. Um, do you think that would work well? If we did that, Sure. Let's even let's even just say let's let's just only focus on the short one. So we're, ignore the truncation issue. If I just give you three hundred words as a, a vector of you know a bunch of numbers from one to twenty thousand or something, um, and then say okay, try to train the model from just the list of words to a sentiment, right? And you know the model is going to work the same way it worked yesterday. We're going to have a bunch of weights. For each of those numbers, and we're going to, you know, have some hidden units that say detect something um, from your input, and uh, after some number of hidden layers, we're going to say, okay, predict predict the output. Um, so how would that would that work? Yes and no. If you have enough data, you can get some reasonable performance. Mm -hmm. If you have one one type that's all about diaper, mm -hmm. okay, and that diaper is a positive review. Yep. Okay, but you don't have any other diaper that talk about that diaper. Yep. So the next diaper that coming with diaper, I can guarantee it will be positive review because diaper is positive. But yep. the diaper doesn't mean anything at all. Okay? Yep. So that's a data bias problem. So that's right. So ultimately I think that's right. If 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 you imagine you know, a data set that has all, kind of all possible reviews in it, or a huge, huge, huge subset of them, um, then, of course, yeah, it'll work well enough if your network is big enough. But otherwise, you have, you know, each, each of your words can have a value, you know, like one of 20,000 different words, or more, actually, in English. Um, and individually, none of the words even mean anything as far as sentiment goes, um, right? Because you have to look at patterns of words. Um, and so, yeah, you're, you're going to learn things like, oh, if the word Brooks, you know, or Schwarzenegger appears in, in the review, it must be positive. Because there was one example in my data set where that was true. Um, but then the next one comes along, um, it's, you know, more or less random whether it's going to be positive or not. And so to actually generalize, you have to learn, you know, some kind of abstract general things. Um, and it's incredibly hard to do that from, you know, 25,000 sentences um, where they're all using language in all kinds of different ways. Um, and so one of the things that's that's a problem is that we have so many different words um, and we don't have a good way to capture relationships. Well, the network would have to learn all possible relationships about synonyms and antonyms and things that, modif you know, words that modify other words and so on. Instead, we're going to try to do a trick. Um, that really made natural language processing much better when people started using it, I think pretty recently, just a few years ago, um, called embeddings. Um, and so the idea is, like we said, there's many ways to say the same thing. And so rather than trying to learn each of them individually, uh, we're going to try to represent words in some more concise way, such that if two words mean the same thing, they have a similar representation. Um, and if two words, for example, um, don't mean the same thing but have the same relationship to two other words, they might have this uh, geometric, the same kind of relationship in, in this encoding. So we'll see what I mean in just a second. Um, yeah, you want to encode similarity between words, um, differences between words, and semantic relationships between words, um, and have a concise representation. So what that's going to let us do is solve these kind of analogy problems. 
Um, and if you, in some ways, if you can capture the, those kind of relationships, then you understand language in a certainly deeper way than if you just have a random number for every word, right? So man to king, woman to what? Queen, right? And like that's trivial for us, um, but how do we, you know, how do we get the computer to figure that out? Um, and the approach is going to be embeddings, um, which is basically going to say for each word, we're going to embed each word in a vector space of some reasonably high dimensionality, so say 100 dimensions. So for every word, we're going to have 100 different numbers, right? Vector of like 100. And the idea is going to be to try to make these vectors um, encode these relationships. In particular, um, saying that, look, if I see these words it kind of used in similar ways in English, then they should have a similar vector. It should be close together in this 100 dimensional space. Um, and if I see them, you know, like I don't, I don't see them in similar context, and I should not be close together. And hopefully, you'll actually get semantic encoding out of that. Um, and basically, that's the approach. You look at a bunch of text. Um, so this is an unsupervised kind of task. Um, you just give it a bunch of unlabeled text, and you try to read it and notice things. You know, it's kind of like the, I mentioned the statistical approach, right? You're going to look at what kind of words appear next to each other. And what kind of words don't, and then you're going to try to train just using gradient descent um, or some other optimization mechanism um, a set of vectors such that well, I guess I have a slide on this, right? Um, try to minimize the distance between the vectors corresponding to two words if those words appear more often. Um, I think I have even more details. Oh, yeah, okay. So, I'm trying to see if there, what else to say. Does this make sense? Right, we look at a bunch of words. We say, look, there was a frog in the swamp. So, I'm going to count how often the words swamp and frog appear next to each other within, you know, say, five or ten words in my giant corpus of, you know, billions of words. Um, and I'm going to count how often the words artificial and frog appear next to each other. So that gives me a bunch of probabilities um, or, or counts. Um, and then I'm going to say, I'm going to start with random, word, random vectors for each word, and I'm going to try to shift them around um, so that the distance between two vectors is small, where the count for the probability that two words appear next to each other is high. And so roughly speaking, sort of to get a more concrete cartoon example of this, um, first, you start with random vectors. Um, then you say, okay, I'm going to try to predict, right, just build like a linear regression model, um, given the distance of two vectors, you know, how far, say, the frog and the swamp vectors are right now. I'm going to try to use that as a, as a predictor of, in, in real life, to actually the log frequency of, the, of seeing those two words next to each other. And then I'm just going to update the weights to make that prediction more accurate. What's the dimension of this? Or is that 10, 20, so the, yeah, the dimension is it's just up to you, but ten, people tend to use something like one, two, three hundred. Yeah, okay. And uh, so initially, the number is randomly assigned. Yeah, you pick a random 100-dimensional vector. Um, and then you just do, you know, you just do optimization and say, okay, um, you know, compute your error in, in this prediction um, and then say, how can I change all the weights for all the words to make that error slightly smaller? So you can basically just do the same thing we were doing yesterday with gradient descent um, and say, you know, what's the derivative of the error on my data set as a function of each of these parameters, take a small step in that direction, recompute repeat. Um, the nice thing about embeddings is that you can just go download one um, that's been pre-computed for sort of various English data sets. As, you know, of course, you can also train your own. Um, but to do that, well, you need a lot of data, and it takes time. But for every vector, the, uh, the categorical variable is the same. So for example, you, have, you can have 300. 
uh, dimension. Yeah. So for frog and for swan, they have the same uh, column uh, length for all 300, or they are different. Right, right, right. So the question is whether the sort of vector yeah. indices are mean the same thing for different words. Yeah. Yes. I mean, well, yes, that's the hope, right? When you start, they're just 300 dimensional vectors with random numbers in them. But what you hope is that by doing this process, it ends up through this optimization, deciding to use the various different elements of your vector for different kinds of concepts, right? So in this case, so the dimension of the, the vector is supposed to be your vocabulary size, because you're talking about. No, so, so unlike yesterday, we were doing something like you know one hot encoding where we would say, okay, for this particular yeah. label, I'm just going to have a one in location 64 and a zero everywhere else. Now we're not doing that. Now we're going to say we're going to map the word frog to some point in a hundred dimensional space. You know, that's not at the extreme, so it's, it'll have fractional values like I'm showing here, um, and we're going to map you know swamp to some other point, and we're going to hope that because those two words kind of are related to each other, they're going to be reasonably close together in a hundred dimensional space. So along at least some of the dimensions are going to be close together. For example, there's probably a dimension that says, you know, these are sort of nature related things. Um, and they're going to be close together in that relationship. Um, and they might be far apart if there's some other dimension that encodes like aliveness. Um, and so alive things have a high value and non alive things have a low value. That's what you hope will get you will get um, out of this training. You know, and it doesn't by any means mean that you're going to actually end up with individual indices corresponding to that, right? You could have some other direction in this hundred dimensional space that involves a bunch of the elements, but still kind of lays things out on some spectrum. So does that mean all the indexes the same, right? So you still try to make sure if you have 300 dimensions, all the index mean the same thing. The in the in the in the indices into the vectors. Yeah, don't mean anything semantically, um, but what they do mean, you know, the idea is when you compute distance between these vectors, right, you're going to look at distance in each dimension separately. So, you, so in that sense, I'm going to compare, you know, the, the first vector and the second vector along the first dimension, second dimension, and so on. Because for me, if we do this way, all the indexes will be similar to a latent variable. Yeah, in some ways. So, somewhat, right? so you have a latent variable. So, so the word frog actually was composed by three different, three hundred different uh, combination of latent variables. So, uh, yeah. So that, that, that's one way to think about it, right? You can think like, look, I'm going to encode this word using. I'm going to assume there's three hundred different things that matter. Well, not just that. Three hundred things, combinations of which might matter. Um, and so then, for each word, I'm going to pick kind of some value for each of those three hundred things. And then hopefully those things will combine in a way that encodes what this word means. Um, let me show an example. Um, I think this doesn't animate in here. This is sort of a, you know, a, a cartoon version um, that shows the idea, right? You're, you're picking, pick, you're hoping to get values. This is in two dimensions, obviously, um, such that if you take relationship between two words, and you move that same relationship in, in a geometric sense, uh, you get, um, you know, you can get, do these kind of analogies, for example. So a direction, in some ways, right, encodes gender. And so you hope that, okay, if I go from son to daughter, you go from uncle to aunt, et cetera, um, in this direction, in this space, wherever you are. Um, and there's another direction that encodes, you know, higher status, right? So you're going to go from duke to king. Um, or something like that. Does that kind of speak to the latent variable or kind of like a latent dimension? Because you're adding all these different dimensions and it's capturing things like gender, which that's not explicitly said in the text. Like, you know, right, exactly. You're capturing these hidden things. And the interesting thing is, right, like, this is an unsupervised learning problem. So it's not like anyone said, oh, I'm gonna, I think gender is important, so let me try to encode it. All I said was, please make words that go together, be next to each other in this crazy space. And when you look at it, um, for some particular set of words, it it turns out to encode, you know, you're like, oh, that's interesting. This direction seems to be gender. This direction seems to be status. This direction seems to be something else. 
Um, so here's another example from a visualization of one of these embeddings, right? Like a bunch of number words are all relatively close together. And small words, right, two, two through nine, um, are all closer together than 20 and 100 and so on and doesn't. Um, one interesting thing is note that one is not in this picture. Because, well, why? It's, just, it's sort of a hard question. Remember that we fed this thing just a whole bunch of English text. So why might the word one be treated differently than the word, you know, seven? The one has many, many different meanings. One has different meanings, right? It's not just a number. It's also things like, oh, someone went over that way. And, you know, one may think that one is a number, but one would be wrong. Um, and so, in the end, you're still encoding just one vector for this number. And so it's, I mean, I'm sure it's not that far away. Um, I, you know, this was just a small snippet of a visualization um, projected into two dimensions from, I forget how many this was, one or 200. Um, but yeah, because it has multiple meanings, it's going to be, end up being treated differently. Right, so the question is, you know, that, that, that's a problem if you're trying to deal with, potentially a problem, if you're trying to read text about numbers and it uses one, two, three, four, five, um, you may misinterpret things. Um, and so there's still, you know, there's a ton of work and usually what people end up doing often is actually some combination of these statistical methods plus the, you know, giant databases of words and their, their meanings, et cetera. Like they're not mutually exclusive. And so you might actually try to say, there's a problem called word sense disambiguation that says, okay, for every word in the, in the sentence, you know, if, if I know it might have many different meanings, try to figure out which one it is based on the context. And so for example, if you have a, you know, a sentence like one plus one equals two, um, you might be able to figure out like, oh, I'm talking about numbers. So if one is probably, you know, because it, there's a plus and there's a two in the sentence. So um, one here probably means the number sense. Um, but yeah, it's language is hard. Um, if that's one of your takeaways for today, that's probably good because you know we'll give we we'll get some sense of how to do this, but really obviously just like all the other things. Um, tons and tons to read, lots of classes you can take, and you know, you can spend years learning about how to do um, natural language processing. But yeah, so here's another cluster. Right, there's a bunch of words related to school and schooling and teaching um, that all seem to be relatively next to each other. Again, when projected down to two dimensions. So in general, there's still going to be more structure that isn't captured here. Um, and like I mentioned, some people at Twitter and Google and Stanford and probably other places have done this on large data sets. And you can just go download an embedding and use it. You can also download an embedding and then tweak it based on your own data set, um, just like we did sort of tweaking of a pre-trained model. You can think of this sort of as a model that says, look, what's the best mapping for each of these words? Um, I can adjust it using gradient descent based on you know the error metric I'm trying to optimize on my training data. Um, so you can do that. And if you want, you can also train your own if you have a big enough data set that it makes sense. Um, note, by the way, right, so Twitter, Google News, and Wikipedia, and this, the giant sort of newspaper corpus, um, they are going to have different, different properties, right? You sort of expect that if I'm trying to make an application for processing, you know, financial analysis, Twitter is probably not the best embedding. Google News may be better. Um, if you're trying to do, I don't know, general English text, um, the Wikipedia one might be might be better, but um, yeah, like we saw in the film reviews, you know, there'll be things like word frequencies that are different in different data sets. Um, okay, so let's go back and actually look at how one might do this in um, sentiment analysis. And in particular, what we're going to do is, you know, now we're going to apply embeddings. So rather than trying to have the network learn about each word completely independently, we're going to use an embedding for each word pre-trained one, 
Um, and then we're going to try some of the methods we already did before. Right, so we're going to pad things to fixed length. We're going to do just a regular fully connected neural network. I don't remember if I actually said this yesterday. Often also called the multi-layer perceptron. A perceptron is basically just that one layer, like linear regression model. And the multi-layer perceptron is just a bunch of them. So that's kind of your standard multi-layer neural network. Um, and then we're also going to try a one-dimensional convolutional network, where we're going to say, you know what? Let's not look at all the words all together. That's too hard. Let's look at small windows um, of the sentence, right? So five or seven words at a time, and then you know, have multiple layers that combine to more complex ideas after that. So I'm going to stop this and go to, to the Batmobile, no, to the code. Hide this stuff. Right, so this is going to be our plan, right? Load the data set again, get rid of can you read that, by the way? Should I make it bigger? Um, get rid of really rare words, because we're gonna, it's going to be hard to learn anything about words that only appear a few times. Pad to fixed length. Replace each word with an embedding, and then build our networks. So yeah, Keras is great and has a bunch of useful things for text processing as well. right? So you can go get things that will yeah, tokenize, there's a function to do this padding for us. Um, we have a bunch of things we already know. I guess all of these we know. Now we're going to have one dimensional convolution and max pooling. Yeah, let's look at, let's look during the break. Um, I should just pull up the documentation for both versions. Um, it might be a 2.0 thing. I think. There were a couple of breaking changes that were sort of trivial, like they moved, renamed a couple of things and moved things from one, one package to another. Okay. Yeah, and I tried to keep it consistent, but I only realized that DSX had a different version after I'd already made some changes. So um, but we can fix that easily during the break. Right, so one deconvolutions, um, embeddings. You can ignore this LSTM thing for now. We're not going to use it just yet. Um, Right. I have tokenizer twice. Whatever. OK, this is all familiar. We load the data just like we did the other day. Um, right, so glove is one of these word embeddings uh, from Stanford based on Wikipedia. Um, I picked the 100 dimensional version. There's versions with two or 300 as well. This one's just smaller. I said, OK, let's use only 200, sorry, 20,000 words, keep only the first. Actually, I think the last 300 words, if it's longer than that. Um, yeah, so we pull out the embedding. It has 400,000 different words in the embedding. So English is kind of verbose. Not verbose, uh, wordy, maybe, is a good word. Um, we're not going to use all of them, right? We're going to only use 20,000. So we need to do some shuffling because the because of that bug in Keras. Um, so pad sequences. There's just a function called pad sequences. You tell it, OK, here's my um, 25,000 examples. Please make each, each of them fixed length. And so that's what it does. Now we have 25,000 by 300. Right? These are still just one number for each word. Um, so we haven't done the embedding yet. Um, so here we're going to say, OK, every number that's bigger than 20,000, we're going to replace with 20,000. Well, 19,999. Um, so now we've gotten rid of all the really rare words. And instead, our network is basically going to say, you know, this film is rare word, something, something, right? So we're just using a fixed number for all the rare words. Um, hopefully, it'll generalize better that way, right? Maybe it doesn't know what a rare word means, but at least it's not going to be able to memorize, oh, I saw this word once. It means it must be really positive. Um, and now we're going to replace. You're trying to, so we, in theory, you shouldn't do any of that. But the idea is if, if there's some word still, right, if 
embeddings will definitely help, right? Embedding means that it'll be a little bit harder for the network to memorize. Oh, whenever I see 50,744, I only saw that once, and it meant that it was positive, so I can just learn a really strong association from that word to positive. Uh, with the embedding, you won't be able to do that quite as easily um, because it's going to have to learn, you know, a mapping that sort of, well, potentially a mapping that can generalize to other other words, especially for the convolutional network where you have the assumption about invariance. Um, but still, if there's a vector that you only saw at once, it might learn something kind of too specific to that vector. Um, in general, even more so, I would say, than um, you know, the image processing stuff we were doing yesterday, it's obvious that none of the things you're doing are quite right. And so you really just have to try different variations and see, like, does this seem to do better or not, given the limited amount of data that I have, which is always limited, right? Um, and so, yes, if I had all possible reviews ever and I could train my network on them, I wouldn't need to do any of this if you saw everything sort of often enough and had enough data to generalize. Because we don't, um, in this case, we really don't have much data, right? We have 25,000 sentences, and data set has more than 25,000 words, um, not to mention all the words it doesn't have that can appear in an extra view. Um, so have to do something um, to, to help kind of make the problem a little bit simpler to deal with our limited data. Um, right. Does that make sense? Kind of. <laughs> um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that, I, mean, I would probably try without. Yeah, I think that's totally reasonable, right? Try without and see what happens. Um, and then if you can figure out, the trick is then figuring out why it's making certain mistakes. Uh, but I guess the one general takeaway is this is a common thing people do um, to make language problems easier, right? They say, look, um, I don't want you being too specific based on things that appear only occasionally. I want you to learn things like, oh, if I said this film made me really angry, like that means it's terrible no matter, you know, what other random things you say next to it. Because you have a lot of uh, mistyping, mis 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 uh -huh. mis Typos, so yeah. There are a few that make uh, words, so you don't really want that. So if you want to pick up the word as more as higher cut, so it's mean, it's more meaningful. So it's been more representative. Right? Typically twenty thousand words is already a lot of words, right? Yeah. So when you go to four hundred thousand, a lot of for, for twenty thousand to four hundred thousand in probably a long term, they have a very, very new minimum cut. So you, you don't typically don't want to have your system biased by this long term. Uh, I mean, yeah, so there's things like, you know, a lot of those 400 word, 1,000 words are typos, for example, uh, which, you know, maybe means you should run a spell check and spell correct before you even start. Um, but somehow, yeah, making your problem simpler is useful. Um, okay, so let's come back to the code. And again, I'm not going to go through every line, but basically now we're going to make this embedding matrix, right? For every word, we're going to have a 100-dimensional vector. And we just go look at our embedding and look up for each word that we still keep, still have what the vector should be. Um, sometimes it's not there, so we just leave it at zero. Um, and then Keras has this embedding layer that you can just put in and say, look, I have, here's my words, here's my embedding matrix of the weights that the network should use to look up the word and get the vector. Um, and right now we're telling it, you know, don't train this. If you don't put that in, or if you make it true, then as you train your network, it'll actually try to adjust the weights in the embedding matrix as well as the weights in the rest of the network. Um, so now let's make a model. We just leave, so we start with a matrix of all zeros. And so if we don't have it, we just leave it at all zeros. Otherwise we replace it with the vector that that's in there. Yeah. Um, Right, so to actually make our network, once we have the embedding, turned out to be very, very similar to what we did yesterday. Um, we just say, okay, we take our input, um, and then we apply the embedding layer. This, by the way, is using the Keras functional API. 
where you actually sort of basically pass the previous layer into the next layer, and that tells it to connect them in the same way as sort of implicitly it was doing in our sequential model we were using yesterday. Um, again, you can look up the docs for the details. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, right, we basically say, look, here's the previous layer, feed it to the next layer, repeat. Um, so we have our embedding. We flatten it into one giant vector. Um, so instead of whatever, whatever, 100 dimensions by 300 words, we're just going to have a single vector of you know 30,000 numbers for each uh, for each sentence. Um, and then we just have two dense layers. We drop out, and we're going to predict positive or negative. Same optimization, still looking at accuracy. Right now, it's binary cross entropy because it's binary classification. Um, and um, yeah, dense network with 30,000 number inputs now. Um, that's a whole lot of parameters, right? So it's like seven and a half, whatever, 7.7 .7 million parameters um, that we're training, plus two more million parameters that we're not letting it mess with. That's the embedding. Um, so hopefully, from our 20, 25,000 Sentences, we're going to get reasonable values for seven and a half million parameters. What are we trying to fit? So this is our data set, right? We have our inputs, our sequences of here's 300 words, which we're going to replace with 30,000 numbers for the embeddings. And the output's going to be zero if it's negative and one if it's positive, or possibly vice versa. I don't remember. Um, so we just run our model. Right, so up here we said, don't train it. Okay. You could train it, but the, the problem is, again, you can, with, without enough data, it's going to be able to make it too, too specific for your training data, and it won't generalize. So here I decided not to, not to mess with it. Um, besides, there's already enough parameters to learn uh, in the rest of the network, at least with this fully connected approach which is a preview is not really a good way to go. Um, right, so I did, you know, 25 epochs, um, accuracy, you know, still going up and flattening out a little bit. Quite good, really, right? We're getting 95, yeah, 95.4% accuracy in the last uh, epoch. Are we happy about this? You're shaking your head no, why? Right, because the, the accuracy we actually care about, right, this is overfitting is still a problem even though it's Wednesday. So really it's not, right, it's a binary task and it's both kind of bad and surprisingly not random, uh, which is interesting, right? Even with this kind of stupid architecture which is trying to connect all words in the whole sequence to all other words and learn all these weights, um, it's able to pick up some kind of pattern that seems to generalize, right? So, no, we. So that's a good question. I guess I didn't skim over that too quickly. Um, the data set is balanced, so there's, it's exactly half and half positive and negative uh, examples. Yeah, because obviously, if, if it was like seventy percent one or the other, then you could just have a really trivial predictor that says it's always positive and will be right seventy percent of the time. No, but here's exactly exactly balanced. Um, so somehow it picked up something pretty quickly, actually, just after a few epochs. But then it's not really running anything after that. You're over, just overfitting. In fact, if you look at the loss, it's actually getting worse. Um, yeah, and so look at the test score. Not so good. Um, so convolutional network is, again, one of those things that's, again, is obviously wrong, but may still be a better thing to do. In fact, almost certainly is a better thing to do, given limited training data. Let's say, you know what, I'm not going to try to learn you know, all the relationships about all the words separately for each position in, in this 300 word sequence. Um, I'm going to make the same kind of assumptions we made yesterday to say, look, if this film is terrible, means it's negative at the start of the sequence, it probably means the same thing in the middle and at the end. Um, and so hopefully, if we look at adjacent words and then build up higher level structure after that, um, that will help us have a much smaller number of parameters, hopefully be able to force the network to 
uh, not overfit quite as much. Um, by the way, I guess I should I probably should have mentioned, and maybe I should have done the experiment. Dropout in that first network was almost certainly the thing that made it do anything at all. Right? So if we go back here, um, I have 50% dropout in the middle of my network between the dense layers. And so what that means is at least it can't just like memorize each of my 25,000 inputs using you know some of these weights just for each 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 one test sequence uh, and say oh as long as i see the word whatever word 494 in this location then it's positive right because the network has more than enough parameters to just encode directly like memorize the input um, but the dropout makes that much harder for it to do That would be my expectation, yeah. So we could, you know, actually, it could be kind of fun to rerun this later um, without the dropout. I would expect actual training to be even faster and go to 100% pretty quickly, and validation to actually be closer to 50%. Um, so dropout is pretty magical, right? Still, like with 25,000 examples, we were able to get some kind of reasonable values for like seven and a half million parameters, uh, which is crazy. I mean, to be fair, each of those sentences has 300 words, but still, still crazy. Um, but now, let's do 1D convolutions. So um, let's see. What is this doing, right? So we say we're going to take a convolution. We're going to have 128 features, like we had feature maps yesterday. Now it's just 1D, um, and we're going to have windows of size 5. So before we had you know 3 by 3 or 5 by 5, now it's just a one-dimensional filter that we're sliding along. Um, activation is still ReLU, um, and we're going to do max pooling you know, more aggressively than for images. So we're going to look at sort of groups of five words at a time, and then take the maximum value for each of these features. Um, for every five words. So it reduces dimensionality quickly. Again, because we don't have much data, I want to try to have a relatively smaller network. Um, so we do this a number of times. And um, yeah, let me flatten the vector to get, get rid of the, you know, basically be able to feed it into a dense layer. Let me have one more dense layer, um, just 128 units, and our classification. Same training. I did not put any dropout here. I forget if I have an example with a test dropout afterwards. You probably sh you probably do want dropout still. Yeah. So you know, do, do you need dropout? Um, the convolution structure itself is a regularizer, right? It's making you say, look, learn a set of weights that's sort of general across the whole image, not just at one location. Um, definitely still dropout can be helpful. Um, in, in particular, often people will do is put dropout in the dense layer at the end. Right? So you can... Yeah, here, or if you have multiple dense layers in between them. Um, it's not, again, it's a rule of thumb. In general, really the rule of thumb is, right, if we're going to look at the learning curve. If our two lines diverge really quickly, that means we need more effort to make it generalize, right? So like, do worse on the training data, but please do better on the validation data, because that's what I care about. Um, so yes. But to start, let's just see what just convolutions do. Um, so now, right, we still have our 2 million parameters that we're not going to mess with, but now we're down to some reasonable number of uh, trainable parameters, right? So 250,000 instead of 8 million. Um, and we train it. It's convolutions again, so it's actually somewhat slower to train. Um, and now it's better, right? The lines don't diverge as quickly. Um, and I also train it for fewer epochs because... It was pretty clear from the last time that, you know, after a little while, it doesn't really help anymore. Um, and it's better, 
it's still, you know, it's noisy, right? So it's not really clear exactly what the number should be, but it looks like we're around 80% um, generalization into the 70. So um, that's better. And um, I think there was some bug with this OSTM thing, so I'm going to skip that for now. Um, yeah, so again, I didn't really try to tune this for performance too much. You could obviously change a bunch of the parameters and see how well that does. You could also try to add more regularization, so add dropout um, or add weight penalties and um, see if that can get you a little bit more of a boost. But so far, still, as you may, you may have noticed, no recurrent or anything, no new kinds of networks, but just embeddings and then some tricks to kind of wrangle your, you know, the complexity of language. Okay. Any questions before we move on to new kind of network? Are we getting anything from Slack Street? Okay. If you're watching online, feel free to chime in with questions or comments. All right. So recurrent networks, um, right? Time um, and sequencing can matter in networks. Um, and so we, we mentioned this actually earlier, right, Greg? You said this at the very beginning. Like, hey, sometimes we have things that refer to things that we said in the past. Um, and wouldn't it be nice if we had a network structure that could read a sequence of potentially a different length and somehow encode things that were important to remember from what it saw before um, and use that as information in addition to what it's looking at right now um, to do something. So yeah, that's what recurrent networks are going to try to do for us um, by having some way to represent the past. Um, and the idea is. You, know, you can kind of get the intuition from these kind of high-level diagrams of how the information flows, right? So far, all of our networks have had these straightforward, um, you know, feed-forward structure where we take our input, we feed it to one layer, to the next layer, to the next layer, to the next layer. At some point, it goes to the output, um, and there's no cycles or anything. So what we're going to do is really just add one more little line. Um, this thing called a recurrent connection. Um, and we're going to say, you know what? If you have some some state, right, some values, some activations in your hidden layer, um, we're going to let you use those as input to the hidden layer, or if you have many layers, to the hidden layers um, as you go. And this becomes maybe easier to understand, or at least a different way to look at it. I think it's useful to look at both. Is the what's called an unrolled view, where we're going to say, look, we're going to feed the network a sequence of information. Let's say words. Um, one at a time now. It's not the whole sequence of 300 at once. We're going to give you just one word at a time. And for the first word, it's just like it was before, right? We have a, our input. We're going to have some hidden layers and some output. Um, but then when we feed in the second word, we're going to feed in the input, right? So the word embedding for the second word. But we're also going to say, you know what? We can actually look at what the hidden layers were after the first word and also have weights for how to transform, you know, how to add those in to the values that we're going to use for, you know, to our hidden layer. So basically, your input now becomes the state from before and the new word. And you can combine those. It's still going to be the same, you know, weighted sums and activation functions, um, and then produce an output. And then when you feed in the third word, now you again feed in the hidden state from the, the second word, et cetera. Um, and so, like, you know, this gives the network some capacity to say, you know what, if these particular values in the hidden state are positive or high or low, that means something that is important to remember about the past. Um, and again, the hope and the power of these networks is that it'll figure it out, hopefully, uh, what kind of things are important, right? So it might decide, you know what, I'm going to use these cells in my hidden layer to encode something about the past. Um, and I'm going to use these other ones to really focus on what's going on with the current input. And I'm going to figure out how those things should be combined in, um, you know, for future words, just by doing gradient descent 
and saying like, look, if there's a good set of weights that can um, can behave well on this problem, hopefully it'll find it. Um, yeah, right. So again, if you look at it in this way, it just has a cycle that says, look, over time we're going to keep feeding this back. Um, you can think of it in this unrolled way, where you just see each copy of the network you know, over time. One thing is that um, you know there's variance in this. So for example, for our sentiment analysis thing, I don't really care about the output until the very end, probably. Um, right? I'm just trying to predict one number. If I was trying to, for example, translate each word as I went along, or say each word as I went along, you would actually want the output at every point. Um, and yeah, so what does this mean for our actual network structure? We're just going to have m one more set of weights that says, how do I, you know, what do I do with the vector that is the previous hidden state as I feed it into my new hidden state? And so, more parameters. Um, yeah, and in terms of how to actually combine this, I didn't. I don't remember if I actually put the the math, but really it's just addition, right? So we're going to take our weight vector, our old W times X weight vector, and we're going to add a new vector called say U um, times H, which is the previous hidden state activations. Um, and then we're going to apply an activation function, et cetera. So no, no magic there, just addition. Uh, magic is always in the weights. I think I screwed this up in terms of animations. Yeah, OK. So well, in convolutional networks, we got a significant amount of power by you know, making certain assumptions that helped us reduce the, the complexity of our model. And we're basically implicitly doing the same thing here. So where, where are we making assumptions about certain kinds of invariance in this model? Or maybe in this model. Are there? Parameters that could be different that are, aren't that we're insisting are the same, or are there certain kinds of locality that we're insisting on, or we could have more arrows than we actually do. Go ahead. Whatever you learn from the past. Yeah, so I think you're getting at something here. Um, you know, we're letting the network remember remember the past, right? And, and depend on what happened in the past, but we're doing it in a very limited way, right? Where imagine you're, you're, you've you, know, you have a sentence or, or some sequence, and you've read through the first 10 entries in it. Um, in general, there's nothing saying that I can't make the next one depend on all 10 previous inputs, right? If I have x1, x2, x3, x4, um, x5 could depend on all of them. And instead, we're making an assumption that says, look, we're going to force the network to remember everything that might matter in its hidden state, and we're only going to have sort of this one step connection from t to t plus 1, um, not from you know, t to t plus 1 and t plus 2 and t plus 3. Um, so you could imagine way more arrows sort of from hidden states from further, further back in the past. People sometimes actually try that uh, because you know, if this is for, for short sequences, this is OK. But for really long sequences, this is going to be difficult for it to remember, you know, keep dealing with the new input as it goes, and still remember, oh, three paragraphs ago, we introduced a new character you know, who was named Diana. And when he referred to Diana, like that's, that's who we're talking about. Uh, because, you know, you only have so much capacity. Um, so that's one connection, right? Sort of locality in, this, in time. We're saying you have to remember everything. Um, and if it's relevant, you have to keep it long. 
And the other connection is an uh, invariance assumption where I sort of implicitly said, and you can kind of see it better maybe in this view, that you know there's weights that we're trying to learn in each of these connections, and, and we're only learning kind of three sets of weights, right? We're learning input to hidden, hidden to hidden, and hidden to output weights. We're not learning a different set of weights for the first element in our sequence, and then a different set of weights for the second one, and a different set of weights for the third one, which in principle you could. And in fact, if you really think about sort of the true model of the English language, almost certainly you'd want to, right? You might want to treat the first word of a sentence somehow differently than what typically a second word or a third word. But we're going to say, you know what, that's too complicated. We're going to insist that you use the same model at every time step. So this is where I screwed up the order of my animations. Um, but right, same parameters at every step. And uh, yeah, only one directional, one step arrows. Training. Backpropagation. You can still compute the derivative of, you know, how do I need to change all the weights or each weight to, you know, reduce the error on my training set. The calculus still goes through. You do have to remember kind of what happened at every time step as you went along and then add up the contributions to the weights from each time step. Um, in practice, it's hard for long sequences um, because essentially you can think of this as just one really, really deep neural network, right? If you have a sequence of 100 inputs, um, you know, your input number one goes through like 100 different layers before it gets to the output. And so if you try to backpropagate um, your error, you know, it's sometimes called backpropagation through time, but really it's just backpropagation through a network. Um, by the time your gradient of your error gets down to, you know, somewhere near the beginning, it's either gone to zero, um, or sometimes it goes the other way and it actually gets really, really big. So there's kind of these two symmetric problems called the vanishing gradient and exploding gradient problems, which can happen in regular, you know, convolutional or MLP networks um, just as well if they're deep, but sort of by definition, the recurrent networks become deep as you try to deal with longer sequences. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to spend the time it would take to get into all the details of how to try to fix that. Roughly speaking, you have to be much more careful in how you train these networks. So there's some initialization tricks that you can do to try to make sure that your derivatives aren't going to get too big um, or too small. It helps to just try to find a way to, you know, solve your problem by only looking at short sentences, short sequences. Um, and there's some other tricks. So one, one is called LSTM, which basically adds more, a little bit more parameters to your network to have it learn rather than just overriding your hidden state um, at every time step. It basically has what's called gates that say, you know what, let me just decide whether or not this is, I should overwrite this particular cell or whether this, this would be a good time to just leave it alone. Um, and so the trick is to make that, I think I have a picture. I do have a picture. Um, I don't know how useful the picture is without reading much more. Um, but basically, you make these continuous things that you can still do back propagation through because they're differentiable. Um, and you say, yeah, I'm going to learn a separate set of weights to decide when to overwrite my hidden state and when to not overwrite it. Um, and similarly, when to have this hidden unit contribute to the value that I'm outputting, when not to. Um, and that can help the network. Again, this is intuition, right? In the end, it's still just linear algebra with some nonlinearities, but it seems to help the network learn uh, what stuff to remember. And so, for example, if you had a sequence, you know, as, as a toy example, if you had a sequence that had real data and then just sort of dummy placeholders that didn't mean anything, every other element, it might learn, oh, when I see this placeholder, I should just not touch anything and just move on. Whereas without this, it would have a much harder time doing that. Um, sorry, I'm trying to play time, time management games here. Well, maybe I'll quickly look at this.
one, well, two, two points, I guess, on LSTMs further. One is, if you're using Keras, you can just say, I want an LSTM layer with this many units, and it does all the magic for you. Um, two, if you are actually planning to do that and do tech stuff, there's definitely more that you can and should read um, to learn more about it as you, you know, start to experiment. Um, where is my text generation thing? I think I didn't open it. Um, right, so here's an example um, that I modified slightly from, from a Keras example. What we're going to do is try to make a, a model of language. So we're going to feed it a bunch of text, in this case, all of Nietzsche's writings. Um, and it's going to try to predict using the history of the, you know, character by character, using the characters we've seen before. I think in this case, we're going to feed it like the last 40 characters. Um, try to predict what the next character should be. And if you can do this really well, then somehow you're capturing how language works at the character level, right? And you can say, OK, given that this is what I just saw, well, A, I should just spell things correctly. But you know, I should have a space, and the next word should is most likely to be such and such. Um, so th this model isn't actually that useful for application, but well, it's useful for making funny, Nietzsche-looking text. Um, but if it works well, it's capturing something about language that you can then use for actual applications, like you know, I'm trying to make a chatbot, um, and I want it to spit out things that look like valid, valid sentences. Right? If you had a corpus of a whole bunch of you know, back and forth discussion, you might try to say, OK, let's, let me try to make this thing predict what you should say, given what the question was. And if it can do that well, then You'll be happy. Um, in general, for that application, you want to combine like a language model that says, please spit out valid English with a more content-based model that says, please also answer the question correctly. Um, and you don't necessarily want to train those at the same time. But that's more complicated. We're not going to, I don't have an example for that. But here, um, right, we just read a bunch of Nietzsche. We are going to do the same kind of thing where we're going to replace characters with a number. And then we're actually going to have an embedding. Is that right? I don't remember how, what I did here. So yeah, here's all my characters in the text, including some weird ones that don't happen very often, but didn't get rid of them. Uh, we have, we're going to do a sliding window thing to get training data. So again, we're trying to predict what the next character should be. So the, the way we're going to make training data is going to take sequences of length 40 as the input. And the next character as the output. So those are going to be x, y pairs. Um, we're just going to slide, you know, take steps of three characters at a time. So in the end, you get 200,000 or so sequences that look like this, right? Supposing that truth is a woman, that duh, 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 the next character should be h. Is there not space? The next character should be g, etc. Right? This is our training data. Uh, number. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I, so step three, I think, is just a way to reduce the size of the data and make the thing train faster. Um, yeah, in general, there's no good reason to do that. Um, I don't think. I mean, in principle, yeah, more data is better, right? Um, in some ways, you're, it's a little, you know, you're making the network learn. No, I think it's really just to reduce the size. Um, what's happening here? Right. Oh, right. So there's no embedding. We're just doing a one-hot encoding for the characters. Um, so we're going to replace each character with a vector of length, whatever it was, 59. Um, and uh, so we're going to have these giant, well, not that giant, but you know, 40 by 59 matrices for each of these. Sequ each sequence is going to have a vector of you know, one hundred coded vector for each letter. Um, so we do that. Here's the first letter of the first sentence, right? A whole bunch of zeros and the one here somewhere. Um, I made some pictures that weren't very informative, but kind of interesting, of the one hot encoded vectors. Yeah, that's just all the characters are used, including some weird ones. 
right? Punctuation, numbers, all the alphabet. Yeah, so this is all lowercase. You, know, you, you could make a model that doesn't have that, it'd be more complicated, but eventually it would definitely learn when to capitalize things. Um, I think I have a link later. There's a great Karpathy, again, um, blog post from a few years ago. I think it's called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of RNNs, of Recurrent Neural Networks, that he basically did this, but trained it on a bunch of different things, like LaTeX and code, and actually got you know, kind of reasonable and hilarious looking things um, in addition to text. Are you running the wall base or you're running character base? This is character based here. Yeah. So trying to learn one character at a time yeah, model. Character yeah. Um, so again, in terms of the actual Keras model building, it's pretty, pretty similar. Now we're going to use LSTM as the sort of recurrent units that have this memory. Um, and these gates to decide what to input and output. Um, then a dense layer after that, softmax activation after that, as usual. Well, dense layer to the number of characters, right? And um, yeah, so pretty simple kind of one LSTM layer model. They're hard to train uh, and they're slow to train. So I didn't want to make it more complicated to start. Um, Okay, I'm going to skip this, but you can read through it if you want. Um, and I'm also going to skip this. This is basically just, oh, so this is sort of useful. When you make this kind of model, you have to decide, you know, you're going to get a probability distribution over the characters for what, you know, what the next character should be. And you have to have some way to decide which character to actually pick when you're generating your text, right? Because the prediction is like, oh, A, probability 0.6, and B, probability 0.2, and C, probability 0.01, and so on. Um, so there's this temperature parameter that we use to um, basically decide how much to explore and how much to always take a thing with the highest probability. If you take the thing always with the highest probability, it's going to be more likely to just output the same thing it learned from. If you, have, uh, if you tell it to explore more, it's going to be more random. It's going to make more mistakes, like typos, et cetera. Like, I told you not to put a B, but you put a B anyway, kind of thing. Um, so basically, if the temperature is low, it means like always take the thing with the highest probability. And if the temperature is high, then it's more even distribution across, across things. So just yeah, so, I have the, so we have the sample function that says, okay. um, given a set of predictions, right? So here's what probabilities are for the 59 different characters that it could be. Pick one. Um, and then once you pick that, then you can feed it into the network again to pick the next one. So it's using just like a you know, normalized exponential thing. Um, OK, so this is just a code to actually run the thing, train it, and print stuff out. Um, but the fun part is the actual output. So let's look at that. All right, so here's it starting. Um, and you're saying, please you know, be pretty conservative. Always take the highest. One, and you get stuff that actually already looks vaguely like English, right? It's not just like a random sequence of characters after one pass through, through the data, but it just gets into loops. And it's like, great, the self, the self, the self, the self, the self. Maybe that's Nietzsche. Um, um, right? So if you say, actually, try to be more, more random, then it doesn't get into loops as much, um, but it also makes up words more, right? Languily, in the Sus. Um, and so, again, it's kind of amazing that after one pass, it's already got captured a lot about language, right? There's spaces. It looks, if you, if you step far enough away, it looks kind of like language. Um, but it's still not very good. Um, if you run it for a while, and again, I decided rather than dealing with the GPUs, et cetera, I would just run it overnight. So it took a few hours, maybe four or five hours on the laptop. Um, you actually get stuff that starts to look like um, look like language, right? And so here with high diversity, um, it's uh, making all these typos. With lower diversity, it's not making as many typos. There's still some presented though. Um, but it's getting into loops again more. Um, but yeah, so somehow, 
you know, it's not very good. It hasn't really figured out how English works. But at the same time, given that it's looking at one character at a time, it's remarkably good. Um, and, uh, you know, it even, for example, this could be a complete accident, but it could be not an accident. Um, closing quotes. Right? So it remembers, like, oh, when I saw a quote, probably I should close it at some point. And it seems to mostly remember to do that, right? There's one quote, there's another quote. Um, clearly, good to sew was a phrase that appeared somewhere in the input because it's repeating it a number of times, um, et cetera. All right, so I guess main takeaway is there, these models are remarkably effective um, and can capture a lot without sort of really any understanding of, of, of the problem they're solving. Um, at the same time, they're not magic and they're pretty hard to tune and train. So if you end up using them, you know, you will definitely want to read up more details. Um, I'm going to skip the sentiment example. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. I guess I, I skimmed over a few things. So the question is, well, first, I guess, yeah, we, we build a model, um, and then you need to give it some seed text. Yeah. Um, so yes, uh, right, because to start, you have to give it something that's okay, now how do I continue this? So I just picked a random uh, part of, uh, you know, of Nietzsche to start from. Um, and, sorry, what was the second question? So how, I mean, oh, and the length, yeah, so then you also tell it how long, how long, in general, so there's multiple ways to handle this. In this case, it just, I think it just says, like, generate, I forget how many characters, some fixed length. Um, you can make models that actually know when to stop in two ways. One is to predict how long the output should be. So basically, uh, sort of first, you run a model that says, I think I should give you seven words back or something. Um, and then just run your LSTM for seven words. Um, or the other way to do it is to have a stop symbol as part of your alphabet, whether it's at word or character level, and to have your model keep going until it spits out the, the stop symbol. Um, yeah, in this case, it's characters. So you give it some characters and you give it you makes more characters. More initial character and then the last, last following character you are. Well, so again, I think for in this case, it's yeah. You know, I think it feeds it something like forty characters and then generates a whole bunch. Um, really, I think in, it, it depends on your application. Yeah, you can give it just one one character. Um, it probably wouldn't do as good job early on, right? It might, it might eventually sort of stumble onto English again. But if I just give you, you know, B, like, what's the next character? I don't know. Um, it would be interesting to try, actually. I wonder what would happen. Joseph, the file of more Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think there's, why not use word-based, right? I think two answers, maybe, or three answers, I don't know. Um, one is just for, for a toy example. Character base is just simpler, right? You don't have to deal with embeddings, et cetera. Um, and you also need less text, I think, in some ways, um, because, you know, if there's, there's so many more words that you would have to figure out how to do that. Um, I think two is that, you know, if you can actually capture things at the character level, you know, it gives you, it gives you more insight into just the power of LSTMs. Again, just as an example. Um, and three, I think, with words, you know, you have to actually have all the various conjugations, et cetera, um, and know which one to use, which I guess it would figure out if you gave it enough data. 
you can you can do a, a grammar check and clean it up. Yeah, so I think again, this is certainly not the way I would build like a chatbot. Probably I would not use character models from Nietzsche. Um, but the idea is just to kind of get some intuition for the kind of uh, you know the kind of dependencies and the kind of structure that your network can learn. These kind of networks can learn. Yeah, I don't know about if people have clever ways to initialize LSTM cells or any other cells, I guess. Um, You could you could figure out some prior, perhaps. Yeah, I think you know. I'm not sure. Right? In, in, in the end, you can make up for some of that with just weights. So if, if when you're training you started at zero, it's going to learn weights that make it work well when you started at zero. Um, if you have some other way to train it, it might work better. I don't know if that's equivalent to just sort of adding a little bit more capacity to your model to run parameters. Um, yeah, I think you'd have to find someone who has actually done a lot more LSTM training in real life than, than I have um, to, to comment on that. OK, uh, let's talk about one more variation on the structure. And then we'll take a break. So encoder decoder. Um, so far, right? we've said, look, I can give you an output for every input, or I can give you an output at the end. But sometimes I don't want that. Sometimes I want different types of things. Um, right? So I want to translate a short sentence to a long sentence in a different language. I want to take an image and give you a uh, you know a caption a description for it or vice versa, and so yeah you can sort of have sequence to sequence so the sequences are a different length you can have vector to sequence where you have a fixed input a variable length sequence and the reverse um, and the way we're going to do this is by kind of stapling together two networks uh, one called the encoder which says okay take my input and just translate it into some representation um, that's a fixed size um, that's useful um, in a, it, for the next part of the network. So then we're going to have a decoder that takes that representation as input and just you know does the output. And so Jeff Hinton in a talk I saw called this encoding the thought vector, which I think is kind of an interesting way of thinking about it. Right? If, if I ask you to give me a caption, describe a picture, Right, you look at the picture, you have some internal representation of that picture in your brain, um, and then you describe it. I'm going to drop my water bottle. That's fine. Um, yeah, so for sequences, it looks kind of like this, right? You take your LSTM, you say, look, just encode me the sentence from English into thought vector. And then you say, OK, now decode this thought vector into German uh, or whatever else. And this is actually what Google, for example, uses for their Google Translate you know, network-based thing. Um, and the cool thing is right now, right, for translation, they can actually use the same encoding for all languages. So their, their current version, they had a cool blog post about this uh, last year, um, actually does sort of all pair language translation in a single model. Right? So they have a whole bunch of different encoders. And then they have a whole bunch of different decoders for different languages. And if you say, hey, I want to go from English to French, it uses the English encoder and then the French decoder. And if you say, I want to go from English to Chinese, it uses the English encoder and the Chinese decoder. Um, so that's kind of cool. In general, right? you can still train this whole thing end to end, because it's really just one network. Um, and you can also, I think I have pictures of this. Yeah, right. you can replace it if you have a single fixed input, say an image. Um, you can just have a regular network that you know, um, takes one input, get, has a bunch of hidden layers, produces the output, and then have the text, or the text, a sequence on the output. So for example, for image captioning. Um, well, I didn't actually get this example to work. Um, 
So I don't know if it's worth pulling up the code. Oops, no, well, maybe it is. But I think it's, yeah, I'll quickly just scan through it. Um, yeah, so this is an, you know, how, how would you do image capturing in Keras? This is, again, just a sketch. It is not fully working code. Um, but basically, we're going to encode images into fixed size vectors using you know, the same model we had yesterday, which we, we know how to do, right? So we take your VGG 16 model that we loaded. Um, we can preload the weights. And then we have a recurrent network. GRU is a variant of LSDM with slightly different set of gates, by the way. Um, that's going to take that 128 dimensional representation and uh, spit out a, uh, a language model or you know a description. And um, yeah, basically, you know, you you can tell Keras to combine two two models, right? So have an image and the language. Um, well, training data is for, for capturing tasks, right? A bunch of images and a bunch of sentences, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the um, take an image and convert it into a, a representation that we think is useful. We're going to take the caption and convert that into a representation we think is useful, and we're going to try to make those representations be the same. Um, and then we're going to say, OK, given a partial caption, predict the next word. That's going to be the sort of LSDM, well, let's use GRUs here, um, part of the model. And fit the model on, you know, given the images and the partial captions, predict me the next word, and so on. Um, I realize this is a little bit vague, because like I said, I didn't actually end up getting this working. Um, but hopefully, it's given you some sense of how you might do this. I guess before I go back to the slides, does this make sense? Kind of, maybe no. All right, well, fine. Um, what do you think? Shri, should we go through these application caches? Uh, Let's take a break. Yeah. We can talk about it after. I think it's more interesting when more people. All right, we're taking a break. Um, and we will come back and talk about these applications and then autoencoders next.